All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's session, CDP Deployment Lessons from the Field. My name is JC Quimbao, Marketing Manager here at Arm Tre or Treasure Data, and I'd like to uh, introduce today's presenter, David Robb. David is the founder and CEO of the Customer Data Platform Institute, which is actually a vendor neutral organization that helps companies make the most out of their customer data. David is a longtime marketing technology consultant and industry analyst and also coined the term customer data platform or CDP um, back in 2013. For some quick housekeeping, an on-demand version, recorded version of this webinar will be available. And lastly, we'd love to hear from you. So if you have any questions during or after today's session, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A below and we will do our best to answer them. All right, without further ado, David, take it away. Thank you, JC, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. As you were just informed, the topic today is deploying the CDP. CDP is the term that's been around now for a while, then coined it in 2013, and the growth really starts to happen in 2016. But just in the last couple of years, we've seen a real burst of deployment of CDP products. And what that means is now we actually have people with real life experience with CDPs. We have a lot of people, in fact, around the industry who've kind of been through this once or sometimes even twice. So there's a lot of experience in the field about what works and what doesn't work with CDPs. And we recently undertook some research where we went out and interviewed some of those experienced people. And we said, well, what have you learned? What works, what doesn't work? You know, we know what the conventional wisdom is, but the conventional wisdom is just conventional wisdom. It's not really necessarily right. So this is like the real thing. It's just the real scoop on what's going on in the CD, on how to do a good job with deploying your CDP. So what do we learn? Well, we've learned that there are kind of three stages. I don't think this is gonna shock anyone. Uh, but there are three topics that you want to talk about. The first is how do I plan? What do I do before I figured out that I really need a CDP? How do I make sure that I understand what I'm getting into here? The second is selecting the right CDP. There are lots of CDPs. We count north of 120. Uh, and they're all different in many different ways. So how do I find the right one? And then the third is once I pick the right one, what, how do I actually execute it? And again, that's where the rubber meets the road kind of phrase. And that's where we find that things aren't always exactly what uh, we expected them to be. So let's talk about what we've learned here. The first thing is simply figure out what you're trying to do. Now we say here, define your needs, but even before you define your needs, you really want to think about well, what am I trying to accomplish with my CDP? That's the place you want to start. What are my goals? And not only what are my goals, but what are everybody else's goals? Because there are lots of different players involved. And we want to make sure that at least we all understand each other. We're not necessarily going to all agree because the IT department versus the marketing department versus the data people versus the analytics people, they in fact may have different goals. And if you have a true enterprise level CDP where sales and service and operations are involved, they're going to have even more different goals still. So let's at least kind of get that on the table, make sure we understand what we're talking about and begin to narrow it down say, this is the vision. This is what the CDP will do. This is what the CDP won't do, or at least this is what the CDP won't do right now. And sometimes that's a hard discussion. Uh, some of our experts told us that, you know, you'll, you'll get disagreement. And not every organization, frankly, is capable of coming to consensus on something like that. So you really need to be very careful about understanding what we can agree on, what we can not agree on, how we're gonna prioritize these things. It's a very important discussion, but if you don't have that discussion, you see it's desirable something for you, ah, can't we just avoid that part? If you don't have it, it's gonna come back to bite. So at least take the time to understand kind of who's in and who's out. So when you get a little further down the process, you don't say, hey, what I thought I was gonna do this. It's like, no, we never told you it was gonna do this. Or more to the point, we told you very specifically it's not gonna do this, or it's not gonna do this in the first or second release. So take your time and at least have a core group who are on the same page with this stuff. And sometimes those peripheral teams, you just have to kind of like say, you know, guys, we're gonna to get to your stuff later. We gotta get this thing up and running. 
So once you've gone through that sort of goal setting or vision setting process, now you're going to come down to the much more specific question of, well, what are my actual needs? Not just what are my grandiose goals, which is do a better job of serving my customers, right? We all want to deliver great CX. That's the goal for the CDP, and that's the goal for pretty much every other marketing technology investment you're going to make. So it doesn't really tell you too much about what will and won't work in terms of the CDP. So now you have to get to the specific things. And that really is a question of what can't I do today that I want to do? What's stopping me from doing it today? Because those are the gaps in my systems. And how is the CDP going to fill those gaps? Okay, it's a very specific set of questions you need to ask yourself. Because the key is what are the gaps that I'm filling? And those gaps are the requirements for my CDP. And those gaps in particular are defined by the use cases I'm going to set. I want to retarget um, customers who've had a drop shopping cart for the classic CDP use case. And more to the point, when they make a purchase, I want to stop retargeting them immediately so they don't have the famous pair of shoes chasing them across the internet that uh, is you know, everyone's nightmares these days, uh, being chased by shoes across the internet. Uh, as does everyone else. That's why I don't buy shoes. Um, so that particular use case, like, okay, well, let's just take that one. What am I gonna do? Okay, I have drop shopping carts. That's not a gap. I can only get my hands on a drop shopping cart. The gap usually in that case is that I can't get that list of people who that were in the shopping cart, dropped it, and then purchased all, which is in the e-commerce system, out into my audience system that's, that's driving my web advertising. My, my retargeting campaigns, either on, the, on web advertising or on email. So it's making that connection, getting it from the e-commerce system into the advertising audience system. That's the gap that the CDP is going to fill. The only way I can really narrow in on that particular gap is going through the use case. Okay, these are the steps to that process. These are things I can do today. These are the things I can't do today. Those are the things I need the CDP to do. And then once I know that, I can say, okay, well, if I need the CDP to connect this source to that source, how am I going to do that? There's some identity resolution questions. The process is more and more detailed. So I go through very specifically, my CDP must be able to do this to complete this use case because those are the things that my current systems can't do. So that's how you use use cases. The other things that you do with use cases, which are equally or actually are, are even more important, is I'm going to take the value of that use case. Okay, what's it worth me, for me to not do those uh, send out those bad messages, those, those unnecessary retargeting messages. I mean, not even a matter of cost as much as a matter of, of getting a better experience to my customers and avoiding annoying them. People are really easily annoyed today, in case you haven't noticed. Um, and the second thing, of course, is I'm going to define what data sources are involved. That was a pretty simple use case. I want to connect to my e-commerce system. But maybe they bought it in the retail store. I have retail point of sale data that I want to link in as well. Not so easy. And if I'm going to do that, then I'm going to resolve the identities between the two systems. I might have identity uh, management source or identity graph, a third party identity graph that will bring in to connect the web ID with the, with the uh, physical address that I might capture in the store. So the use case is going to tell me the CDP requirements I need, but it's also going to show me the business value. It's worth X to do that. And then it's going to show me the data sources. Now, use cases are fun. We love use cases. Uh, all good consultants love use cases. But they're also a lot of work. So the pro tip here was, eh, you know, only do three or four, three or five or some of those in depth. You could do many more. And again, they're fun to do, but just do a few. And what you're going to find, honestly, after the first five or so, is there's a lot of repetition going on. So take the time and do them right, but don't think, oh my gosh, I'm going to boil the ocean here. I have 35 different use cases, because you can easily list 35 different use cases on your whiteboard, no sweat. But you don't have to do 35 in depth. Just pick a few. And once you begin to see that, you know, we're getting a lot of repetition here, you can kind of move on. And use cases are not enough. Okay. Yes, use cases are important, but they're kind of narrow. Okay. They're specific things I want to do. You need to step back and say, well, okay, even if I got these technical capabilities, do I have the people? Do I have the business processes? Do I have the content? Do I have the other resources? that I'm going to need to complete these use cases. These are other gaps. And even more broadly still, do I have the capability to use the CDP in other ways 
that are not specifically listed in my use cases, because I know there's going to be lots of other new things to come up. And do my people have the right skills? Do my systems have the right connectivity, both to ingest the data, or, get, or actually push the data into the CDP, because I have to get it out of the source systems, and then on the delivery side to use the CDP to take advantage of the information that's in the CDP through personalized marketing and dynamic content and all the cool things you'd like to do with that is great data that comes from the CDP, do my systems have the ability to do that? So you have to look at those broader capabilities, identify a broader set of gaps, and again, make sure that you can handle those and you can close those or have a way to close that, at least have a path forward to closing those. You're not gonna close them all overnight, okay? The other thing you need to do outside of use cases, look at your source data. This is, comes up consistently in our conversations with people, but the data is worse than you think. No matter how bad it is, it's actually worse until you look at it, just but get over it. Um, so take a close look at your source data, understand what's usable, what's not usable. And the keyword there was close. Yeah, okay, yeah, there's a field here that says uh, customer ID, look at but that's not the same customer ID as this field that says customer ID over in this other system. I'm gonna match those two things together. There's a field here that says last purchase date, but guess what, it's on your last e-commerce purchase date. Or it's the last contact date, but it doesn't include the call center contacts, whatever the issues are. Take a close look at your source date and again, expect that it's gonna be worse than you think. Now here, another pro tip, we have lots of pro tips here because we spoke to a lot of pros, okay? Look at those requirements and think about the organizational maturity. Again, what can my organization actually manage? What kind of skills do I have? What kind of resources? Not that, not that your people are not smart. It's not how smart they are. It has to do with how many they love them, how sophisticated, how well trained they are, lots of issues. Find your smart people in the world who just don't have the resources supporting them to do the most sophisticated programs that you can easily get imagined on that imaginary whiteboard. So make sure your CDP requirements are matching. And make sure you don't buy too much, don't buy too little, the whole Goldilocks thing. All right, so moving along to the question of the selection process. This, this, is big, this drives me crazy, okay? I, I had a couple of people, and this is my own consulting experience, say to me recently, oh yeah, we don't know what we need. We're just gonna do a half dozen proof of concepts and we'll see what the systems can do. We're not gonna bother to figure out in advance what we need or even to understand what a CDP to, can do because we'll just figure it out when we get our hands on it in the proof of concept. This is a bad idea. This is a really, really bad idea, okay? If you don't, know in advance what you want that CDP to do, then you have no way to structure an intelligent proof of concept, okay? If you haven't defined the use cases in particular to say these are the specific functions that I need, you don't know what to test in that proof of concept. If you have no clue about what a CDP can do and you just want to poke around, well, guess what? That would be like getting into a car if you don't know how to drive and say, oh, what happens if I pull this knob or that knob or twist that little thing? Maybe you'd start the motor and maybe you wouldn't. Maybe to be able to turn the radio on and say, eh, sound quality of this radio is, isn't much and it's not worth $30,000 for a radio with dubious sound quality. And you wouldn't even realize it aren't being drives. Okay, so you have to figure out in advance what you expect it to do and then set your testing up to do that. Which means anybody who, who tests a half dozen system PLC is doing something wrong. Okay, they didn't narrow down in advance sufficiently what it is they wanted to get out. So, POC really should be proven specific things that you're not sure. Can it scale? Can my this the can interface create campaigns that are as complex as I want the campaigns to be? Whatever the particular things are, again, going back to the gaps that you need to close. Figure those out, test those in depth, but you gotta know what they're gonna be in advance. One or two systems. That's all you should be testing here. How, where you have specific questions. This system looks like it meets my needs, but I'm not sure it can do this or that. That's what you're testing in a POC not just, oh, kind of what's a CDP do in general, okay? And that's the pro tip there. Don't use it as a discovery tool, as you can tell. I really did not like hearing that from that particular uh, person. Um, and it was quite cranky, still cranky, months later. Um, okay, still focus, still on the selection process. Focus on your business goals. Don't get lost in technical details and, and the actual comments from a couple of our vendors uh, are, are um, consultants that were mostly and, and users, not really vendors, was, you know, if you let the IT guys do it, you let the data guys do it, the analytics guys do it, they're gonna look at technical stuff because that's what they care about. But guess what? The marketers who are gonna be using this, or at least um, kind of using the outputs of this, they have other needs. And if they're not 
actively engaged in so in determining what to look at, those needs are going to get lost and you're going to end up worrying about technical details. And at the end of the day, they're fun and they're interesting. They might even be important, but they're not really the core thing. So make sure that those selection criteria are linked to the actual project goals, okay? What business goals am I wanting my CDP to serve? Okay, and make sure that the selection criteria map directly to those. And then this, this, the technical details are simply supporting details. You're like, okay, I, my business goal is to do better personalization. That means I need to have certain kinds of data. I need to have certain kinds of low speed to do it from going to do real time on my website. I need to have um, certain kinds of uh, predictive algorithms available to, to make those decisions. Lots of specific technical things, but they better be attached to the project goals because otherwise it just go chasing uh, after cool technical stuff that in fact is not really relevant to your issue. And again, the key to that is that pro tip of keeping those business users involved. Don't just delegate it and say, yeah, I've told you what I need, uh, IT department or analytics team, you go find the best one for me because they'll find the best one that they think is for you. Nothing uh, that they're doing in any way without good faith, but they won't necessarily find the best one because they don't know your business as a marketer the way you know your business if you're a marketer. It's really important to keep the business users involved. Third, that was awfully quick through selection, I must say. Uh, I want to go back to selection. <laughs> There's certainly more to it than that. Part of it with selection is, again, understanding the scope of what you're trying to accomplish. And this is where some of the technical stuff comes in again. You've gone through, you've done your gap analysis, you found out that what you really need is maybe just pulling together those unified customer profiles. Again, that's the core thing of the CDP. All CDPs do that. But what if you actually had a gap in something like predictive modeling? Well, yeah, you can go out and buy a separate predictive modeling system, and there's some good reasons to do that. But if you really don't have anything, and you don't have like users who are saying, you're gonna you know, cry for my cold dead hands to get me to not use the tool that I've used since I was a pop, then you want to say, okay, I can find a CDP that has predictive and data unification in the same system. Why not buy one system that has both? Saves me a lot of grief, saves me some integration work, lots of you know, arguments in favor of that. Again, not that you would ever select a bad predictive system or campaign management system or even delivery system uh, just because it's part of the CDP, because you want something that works, always again, not getting involved with technical things, but worrying about business goals. But if it does work pretty well, then all things being equal, try to find one that does both. And again, there's CDPs that do all these CDPs that just do data, CDPs that just do data plus analytics. Guess what we call those analytics CDPs? They're CDPs to do data and analytics and message selection or campaign management. We call those campaign CDPs, although it's more about message selection than actual campaigns. And there are some that even do delivery, all, all those things plus delivery, delivery CDPs, get cleverly call them. So, you know, when you get down to that level, often the CDP is just part of a much larger system. It's like, well, I need a you know, new entire customer facing infrastructure and oh, it'd be nice to have a CDP built in. Now, vendors who have a standalone CDP would say, you know what, make sure you get a CDP that works. Okay, just because something's built into some larger suite, again, if it doesn't meet your needs in the same way that you wouldn't use the predictive capability cause just because it's kind of like an, you know, part of the CDP that you're buying and you're really buying the CDP because it's good for data analysis, you wouldn't, use an inferior CDP just because it's part of the email suite or the even you know, multi-channel customer engagement suite that you're buying. And we see plenty of situations where people have actually more than one CDP because they have a CDP that's really good at data and that feeds the data in to the other CDP that's good at one of these other things or has some other features involved. So be realistic about what the scope is of the gaps that you're trying to close. If you can find one CDP that does them all well, fabulous. There are some good CDPs out there that have that scope. But if you can't find a CDP with the broad scope that also does the particular things well enough to be useful, have it say, don't buy that and use an inferior product just because it's all in one. Um, I'm sure there's some analogy to buying, the, go to, going to a restaurant and you know, eating a bad dessert because dinner was good, but I can't even think how that works. Just make sure you buy it. Get the systems you need. Um, all right, so we now get into execution. Uh, we are now in our little mental world here. We've already selected the CDP. It's the perfect CDP. 
Does everything we need and nothing we don't need. That's just good job. Pat yourself on the back here a little bit. Okay, but now we're going to actually have to make it work. And guess what? The work is just beginning. So the one universal recommendation that you'll see in every presentation is something about incremental deployment. Sometimes they talk about crawl, walk, run. Sometimes it's eat the elephant one bite at a time. Sometimes it's eat the low hanging fruit. You know, I always kind of combine those like, you know, crawl towards the low hanging fruit and then eat it one bite at a time, something like that. It's a good image that I keep in my little head. Which gives you some idea how my head works. But many of you are going to do things incrementally. It is, in fact, important. Everybody, one thing again, universal. Um, this just makes sense. Take a couple of use cases and kind of get those done and then expand. Because if you try to do five things at the same time from the start, nothing's going to get done. It's really quite that simple. And in particular, limit the number of data sources. Because again, remember, there's your pro tip down at the bottom there. You're going to have dirty data. Well, it's one thing to fix one source of dirty data within your three month time frame or whatever it is that you want to get that first use case up. And it should be pretty quick with the CDP. It's another thing to all of a sudden say, oh, this use case, my first use case, it happens to require six different data sources and they're all miserable. That makes me sad and it's going to delay me substantially. So don't do that. Pick a couple of one with a minimal number of sources and indeed minimal number of demands on other resources as well. So not one that involves every department in the company or every channel in the company or, or every uh, imaginable kind of predictive modeling algorithm and so on. Just pick something that's kind of small and manageable, get a couple under your belt and then slowly grow over time. So indeed start to crawl, then do your walking, then do your running. It really is uh, excellent advice and universally uh, acknowledged. But don't just think about those first few use cases, you do need a long-term plan. Okay, let's be really clear about that. So plan out your first dozen use cases, you know, your first six, 12 months worth of work um, in, in advance, partly because you want to sequence those so that you're like incrementally adding data sources or adding other resources. So you want to look ahead and say, you know, this use case here that, that needs six data sources, this use case needs five, this use case needs four. You know, if you're really lucky, of course, they line up beautifully. So each new use case that you add, you know, adds one more data source. It's not going to work quite so simply, but uh, at least you want to be able to look at, kind of think that through. It's kind of a fun little puzzle to pull together if you're uh, of a certain um, mindset, uh, in which case, if you are, you're like absolutely in the right business. Um, so, those first couple of use cases, again, they need to be simple enough, but they also need to be linked to the project KPIs. They really need to show value because those first couple of use cases are indeed key to kind of building support. You know, maybe everybody in the company is just all gung-ho about the CDP and they're, they're true believers, but you still want to actually confirm to them that they made the right choice and, and there might be a few skeptics. We need to say, oh yeah, this thing actually did deliver value sooner rather than later. Once you've got a couple of those uh, under your belt though, then our experts said, you know, then you can begin to switch to the use cases that, that incrementally expand your data sources. So it's kind of a pretty uh, clear rule for how you want to pick those first few use cases and then those next few use cases. And the pro tip here, you know, set milestones. Okay, that's not exactly the most uh, brilliant and unexpected advice you've ever seen. We have found though in our research that there is a quite strong correlation uh, between people who do things methodically and people who have greater satisfaction with their marketing technology investments in general, with their CDP in particular. Again, this is not exactly a surprise. In fact, it would be surprising if we found that being disorganized correlated with high satisfaction. Um, but uh, it is, in fact, you know, a proven scientific fact that if you do things like have a center of excellence to train people up, if you have specific metrics that you track, if you have a long-term plan, if you have uh, standards for compatibility that your investments uh, have, have to be evaluated against, all those kinds of things. Uh, if you have an agile methodology as well, any of those methodologies, anything that just says, oh yeah, we're actually managing this sort of intelligently, not haphazardly, all of those things certainly correlate with high satisfaction. And I think we can reasonably say they actually even contribute to high satisfaction, even though, of course, correlation is not causation. 
in case you were wondering. And the other side of this, there's a lot of on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, I am, of course, a consultant, I have two hands. Um, so yeah, you need a plan, but of course things will change and, and you can't be crazy, uh, rigid about your plan. You know, there are gonna be new things. This is the world we live in. Certainly as marketers today in particular, it's the world we live in. You know, you're gonna have new data sources pop up. You're gonna have new channels pop up. I was just chatting with somebody today about conversational marketing you know, chatbots and things, or conversational commerce, right? And you can order through a chatbot. You can order visually today. We saw, uh, just I was fascinated in the newsletter, uh, we saw an article about, um, happened to be Kroger, uh, but a grocery store that had one of these programs that you tell it what you have in your kitchen cabinet and, and sends you recipes, and that's a pretty common thing. Uh, but this one you didn't tell, you just took a picture of what was in your kitchen cabinet and had the AI to look at that and recognize what those ingredients were and then come back to you with, okay, this is what you can make with that uh, combination of pasta and chocolate chips and um, raisins that you have been storing so preciously. Uh, not sure what that comes out like, but let me know if you try it. In any case, but it was, it was, it was visual. The point was it was like an AI system. It's just, you didn't even have to type in. So that's a new thing. That's a new kind of interface. Uh, good luck getting that into your CDP, but it will be possible. And some of your marketing programs, I and mean, that is in fact a marketing program if you're a, a grocery store. So we're gonna have all these new things that are gonna pop up. You know, again, you're, you're talking about planning 12 to 24 months. Well, 12 months ago, October of, I don't know what year it is, 2019, uh, you probably did not anticipate in your plan a global pandemic. I'll guess that you didn't. Um, We'll go there. Uh, so, you know, things change. Things change. Obviously, they've changed a great deal this year, but, but think back any 12 or certainly 24 month time frame uh, in the last 10 or 15 years and what you thought you were going to be doing and what you, in fact, were prioritizing two years later is not the same thing. So, just that's going to happen. Expect their plan on it. Keep sort of flexible. Uh, the other big thing that comes up that we see consistently, which we love, of course, to see is that. There are going to be people in other departments who, once you have that CDP up and running, are like, oh, you have all this data over here. I would love to use all this data. Can I have some? Give me a bucket of that. Um, and that's great. And again, that goes back to what we said earlier about setting that vision, that shared vision, and not necessarily involving everyone from the start, because then you'll end up with this huge laundry list. But once it's up and running, then you can kind of expose it to those other folks to, hey, Look what, look at what I have here. Would you like some of this? Uh, and more likely they'll come to you. In fact, say, oh, I heard a rumor that you have this data available. I've never been able to get my hands on this data. So you're going to see that interest. And here's your pro tip, right? There's going to be a lot of interest. It's a good thing, yay for interest, but it also means that you're going to have to prioritize. So to find some metrics that's, that allow you to evaluate those alternative use cases. So, okay, well, this department wants to do this. Oh, what's that really worth? How much labor is involved? Let's, let's have some standard way of assessing that so we can compare the request from this department versus the request from that department and make sure that we're kind of prioritizing in, in a, an intelligent way. And this, of course, assumes that your company is totally data-driven and no politics. Uh, and raise your hand, uh, you know, if that's your company. But even so, a few hands up out there. Um, by and large, you think I can't see you. Um, by and large, you'll at least have some chance of having some rational decisions, even though certainly politics will intervene. Okay, again, getting back to this, not just technology, all right? Your staff has to be ready for this stuff. This is, a, 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 again, a classic mistake that people brought up. It's like, yeah, they bought the system, they didn't train anybody. Or because, oh, you know, we're out of budget, we're out of time. So I think, oh, we didn't have time to train anybody. It's like, okay, yeah, that airplane took off in a crash. We didn't have time to train the pilot. It's like, eh, I don't want to fly on that airline. Build it into your project plans and don't skip. Don't let that be your flex thing that you switch down if you start to uh, run over someplace else. And build a lot of it in. And remember, it's not just a one-time thing because staff changes, needs change, systems change. You're going to have to retrain people. You have to constantly retrain people as, as things change. And that's okay. The favorite thing about training with somebody is, well, what if we train people and they leave? And it's like, well, what if you don't train them and they stay? Okay, so training is really important. 
Okay, so plan on it. Plan if you can. If you're doing this incremental deployment, that means you're going to have old and new systems running at the same time. And that's a little extra work. So you may need to add some resources to handle that extra workload. Uh, but of course, it also, it also gives you a little bit of fail safe and it also comes back to the incremental deployment notion. You're not going to switch everything open overnight because that would mean everything would have to be running in the new system. So as you do your incremental thing, one of the use cases at a time, you can slowly begin to switch from the new system, uh, from the old system on into the new system. So plan to do that. And our pro tip here, don't skimp on documentation, which uh, again, uh, totally conventional wisdom, but often uh, not actually followed. So you know, don't be that guy. Be the guy who has great documentation, because again, then when something unexpected happens and people uh, can't all be in the office at the same time for some unimaginable reason, uh, they at least have good documentation they can look at uh, so they don't have to be like, constantly uh, pestering each other remotely. Okay, and then finally, we come down to the notion of managing change, all right? CDP is part of it. You know, a lot of digital transformation projects underway now, and, and the pandemic has actually accelerated a lot of digital transformation projects, which is basically a good thing. Uh, but it does mean that the CDP, which will support a lot of those projects, and CDP actually has kind of, in many cases, been accelerated because of digital transformation, because it was key to achieving that accelerated digital transformation, um, it still has to be factored into those larger plans. And CDP is not isolated. Just think of it as part of that transformation of those larger projects, and then again, make sure all those other pieces are in place, the other technology, the staffing, the organizational um, uh, cooperation, the metrics, that are what drives organizational cooperation, reward systems, all those good things. So again, you know, change management 101 stuff. Uh, but a lot of companies and people are really bad at change management. So just because we kind of know how it should be done doesn't mean we always do it. So let's 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 be very conscious in focusing on the change management that we're going to do. And the, the pro tip here again was to run those parallel systems when you can, because you can't always do it. And that's that's another thing that often gets uh, 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 dropped from the project plan at the end. So, yeah, we don't have time to run in parallel. Well, I've seen that happen a couple of times. And uh, sometimes it leads to, let's just say, unintended consequences. So, summary. Good to have a summary slide. Some conventional wisdom is worth following. Again, the two big ones that everybody says, and they're all totally correct. Yeah, crawl, walk, run, do that stuff incrementally, eat, eat that. Uh, eat that low hanging elephant or something. Um, use cases are essential. Again, we can't get away from use cases. We love use cases, uh, but they have to be done right. They have to be used intelligently. Uh, some things we see people doing, maybe they shouldn't do. Again, don't over rely on the proof of concept. It really is just something that's designed to answer a few very specific questions. It's not designed as a shortcut so you don't have to do proper research and understanding and, and vision creation, sh vision sharing, shared visionary, whatever it is. Um, and then again, don't delegate that evaluation to technical spe specialists. Don't just let the IT guys pick it for you. You probably wouldn't, but uh, sometimes that, uh, or don't let them dominate the discussion. And even if you don't delegate to them, they'll, they will have lots of good questions. They should all be answered, but don't, get, don't let, getting those questions answered, prevent you from getting the other honestly more important business questions answered. And then here are just some common problems that people sometimes don't want to talk about. Uh, you know, you're going to have bad data, allow extra time for that. Data wrangling is the number one headache. Our, our professionals consistently told us, expect it. You know, the good news is everybody has a problem. Don't feel bad, but do expect it, do plan on it. And the other one, again, which not everybody really wants to talk about out loud is, yeah, there's going to be conflicts. Departments are going to have different goals. Expect that. Plan to manage it. You know, don't hide it, under, don't sweep it under the rug, but uh, don't, um, don't be totally shocked when that happens either. So that's a lot of wisdom for uh, 35 minutes or so. I hope you guys, hopefully you have your wisdom quote at least for the next hour. You know, I don't want to be too ambitious here. Um, but there's more. We have perhaps some questions if uh, people are still out there. Uh, JC, anybody uh, have any questions?
Yeah, thank you, David, for the great presentation. We'll, uh, we'll now take some questions from the audience. Looks like this first one. So I know you briefly covered narrowing down POP choices with so many great options in the market. How do you narrow it down and what templates do you follow to get down to one to two choices to deeply POC? Oh, what an excellent question. Thank you. Um, so we, uh, we look at a few things, all right? We do think of it as kind of a funnel, not surprisingly. Um, you know, there are first some things that you filter out of those 120 vendors. You want to start with that universe, like, well, do they even sell in my region? Because they don't, they don't all sell anywhere. So, so, you know, will they even do, can I even do business with them? Okay, that, that eliminates some. Are they roughly in my budget range? You don't really know what your budget is. We understand that, and the vendors are all on different levels of budget, so different, the same vendor obviously has different prices for different people, usually based on volume, sometimes based on other things. So, but you know, some systems are simply uh, too expensive for some companies and others uh, are really aimed at small business. There are some small business CDPs, believe it or not. Um, and, and then industry expertise, a little dicier here. There are some vendors who are specialists in one industry. Uh, and you know, if that's your industry, that's really great. There are other vendors who service a lot of industries. And as long as they have competency in your industry, among many others, that's okay too. But you know, you're not going to buy a travel CDP if you're uh, in the uh, retail industry. There's simply your different things, and every vertical specialist has connections to to the systems that are relevant to that industry, and, and they have people who are deep experts in that industry. So if you're a travel CDP, you have people who really understand ticketing systems and such. Um, so it's nice to find industry experience again, whether they're an industry specialist or whether it's simply one of a number of industries they have experience in. And sometimes a general purpose CDP can do it too. So once you kind of, those, those are the easy ones to be honest. Like, okay, that'll eliminate a bunch of them. Then you can really begin to look at features. Uh, and hopefully it came out clear that it is important to really understand the specific features that you need, not the features that the vendor wants to demonstrate in their demo because they're really cool. I mean, yes, that's fun. And we all love, uh, you know, flashing lights and, bells and whistles, but in reality, if they have like this really nifty geo mapping visual interface where I can, you know, poke my finger on the capital of Russia and a pops an image of Vladimir Putin or whatever it is, that may be nice, but it's probably not actually a business need that you have. Okay, whereas if your real business needs to do a Denny resolution and do the matching of certain kinds of matching, that doesn't demo particularly well. It's actually like really boring to look at matching algorithms. But you really need to understand that that's going to work. And again, that's where your POC comes in. That's what you test because there's no way to look at someone's description of their identity resolution methodology and say, oh, that's the best thing ever or not. Yeah, that clearly won't work. I mean, sometimes you can look at it and say it won't work because it's just, if, if you're an expert, okay, and even there you need expertise. And that is the other thing to bear in mind is when you begin to look at features and to understand uh, whether a feature will meet your needs or not, you do need somebody in the room who actually knows this stuff, which may be bringing in a consultant, it may be bringing in some of your IT folks, somebody that has some expertise with, that, with this particular function so they can look at it. Because there are a lot of different ways to do these things. So there's only one way to do it. So just because it's the way that I'm used to, or you're used to, or your um, head of analytics is used to, doesn't mean it's the only way to achieve it. But you do need somebody who can at least look at it sort of uh, with an informed knowledge and say, yeah, I can see where that would work, or Okay, there's no way that works. And if they're smart and in their head they're saying there's no way that works, what they're actually saying out loud is, yeah, let's get into that in a little more depth. I'm interested to see how you accomplish that with this particular approach. And just, you know, and then if they actually have a way to do it, nobody's kind of going out on a limb and been embarrassed by being proven wrong. And if it doesn't do it, then they can just like sort of chuckle to themselves in a self satisfied fashion, hopefully when no one else is around. Um, yeah, so focus on features. Don't, you know, don't get hung up, honestly, on price. Terrible idea, because a cheap system that doesn't work is useless. It's a very, that's a really bad, a very expensive decision to buy something that you can throw away. Um, and an expensive system that works really well will more than pay for itself. And don't get too hung up on easy use. This is a more ambiguous uh, problem, right? Because you do want a system that's usable, of course. But this is where it comes back to matching things against your organization. If you have super technical users, because you're a big giant company, you have lots of people who are experts at this and that, uh, they can deal with a system that maybe doesn't have the, the, the simplest interface. 
if you're a small company and, and you know time is very limited and you don't and your users are really just marketers who are going to kind of do this you know an hour or so a day then you really need something that's actually quite easy to use so again maps that level of uh, complexity of ease of use to the uh, nature of your organization um, and the other big one is integration that actually comes up as the number one requirement um, that everybody looks at and everybody should look at is make sure it can simply can connect to your systems, both your source systems and your uh, con consuming systems, your delivery systems, whatever's going to take the data from the CDP. Uh, you know, all CDPs have, have connectivity against our being a CDP, but some make it easier than others. So take a good close look at that uh, and make sure it's going to work for you. Great. Thank you for the answer, David. So the next one uh, came early in the conversation as well. So cookie jar, cookie jar question, these data sources are owned by different people who don't necessarily have the same goals. How do you handle this with the same priorities? Right, and, and that is, again, that's like, okay, welcome to reality. <laughs> it would be nice if we were all just uh, working together for the, you know, the greater good of the uh, organization, but kinda, that's not how it works here on planet Earth. So you are gonna have conflicting priorities, so you need, to do a few things. And part of that depends on organizational culture. You know, if you are a really analytical kind of data-driven organization that does have a history of cooperation uh, and consensus building, you can actually kind of get everybody in a room and at least try to come to a consensus. And there are all sorts of ways to do that. If you're an organization that is, you know, just like very political and people are not used to cooperating with each other, uh, you're going to have a problem and you're going to have to just sort of Find somebody who has the authority to say, this is what's in and this is what's out. Um, and if you can't find that, your project may well just sort of get mired in, in problems. If that happens, then you just pull the scope in. I mean, that's the answer to that conundrum. Okay, if you really can't build company-wide consensus or whatever, whatever scope-wide consensus is relevant, you just pull it in narrow and narrow. You know, we're just going to do some marketing. Okay, and you guys over there in, in customer success, yeah, in theory, you could get a lot of value from this, but we just can't get it done if we include you right now. And, you know, some people might disagree with that. Okay, but again, it really depends on the organization. Certainly, that's the last resort that I would ever take. I never want to do that, but if that's the only way you get it done in your organization and the alternative is to get nowhere, then that's what you got to do. So very, very uh, situational. But uh, you know, keep the goal in mind, and you do what you have to do to, to ultimately service the needs of the company. I mean, it's not ultimately about your own department; it's ultimately about the company. But if the system's never going to get off the ground, that doesn't serve the company either. So you may have to do some things that are necessary just to make it happen. But... Okay, great. And so our next question, so what about a B2B and B2C hybrid use case? Are the use cases different for a customer platform? How do you wrap those together? And moreover, how do you identify the key stakeholders to own the project? Okay, do we have another hour for that one? Um, there are, all right, let's see. So B2B and B2C, uh, some organizations do both. I think that was the uh, question here is what happens when they do both. They both have, Obviously, a lot of common requirements, but you know, B to B data in particular has accounts and contacts. You know, and it's a level uh, that B to C, which is usually dealing with the individual consumer, but might be dealing with the household, usually doesn't have. So you have that fundamental sort of mismatch of the two data types, and, and you have to make sure that your system can deal with both. I want to be able to look at this view. That's an individual level view that's going to service my consumers. In fact, some of my B2B marketing, I'm going to look at that view, which is an organizational view or an account level view that says I want to aggregate this stuff up so I can see what's happening at the account level, say, for my account-based marketing programs, for example. So you need to make sure that whatever system you're working with can do both of those. Um, beyond that, when you're dealing with them, you need to look at different data types. You know, B2B data is company data, comes from different sources. A lot of B2B marketing uses third-party data from well, a number of vendors I probably shouldn't 
you know, name, name names, but you know, you can go out and you can buy that data. Consumer data, there's some third-party consumer data available for enhancement, but it's, it's a little more limited. Privacy raises more issues with consumer data than it does with business data, for example. So you're gonna have some different issues related with that. You're gonna have some different matching issues because a lot of B2B matching uh, really requires reference data because it's just not obvious that um, you know, uh, Google is owned by Alphabet. I mean, you know that and I know that, but you can't look at the name and say, oh, Google and Alphabet are obviously the same company just based on the name. So it, it, there's just more complicated, whereas you could probably look at my address and say, ah, oh, 730 Yale Avenue, 730 Yale Street, probably the same person, um, that kind of thing. So there, there are a lot of uh, differences in sort of the process and nuances that, that you have to deal with. And it all comes back again to your use cases to, um, you know, understand exactly what you're trying to accomplish. Was there more to that question? I think I kind of forgot the end part. Yeah, I think you answered the first two and the other ones are, how do you wrap those two together and how do you identify the key stakeholders to own the project? Ah, uh, okay, so wrapping them together, as I say, just honestly, just looking at your use cases and making sure that you can beat them both separately and, and then uh, you can meet them in combination and they will, they will overlap in some places. In terms of identifying the key stakeholders, um, I'm, I'm sitting here puzzled because usually the stakeholders come out of the woodwork. Usually it's a matter of like more likely that you have to de-identify the stakeholders, decide who to exclude than it is they have to go out and beat the, you know, beat the bushes to find, oh, who's in charge of our, our ABM programs. Like, yeah, there's probably four people who at least claim to be in charge of the ABM program. Um, but in any event, uh, I, I may, maybe perhaps the question that's being asked here is, I'm thinking about a CDP, how do I know who would benefit from it? Because those would be the stakeholders. Uh, because I think this is a good project and I mean, I'm in charge of Martech, for example, you know, I'm not myself a business user in this scenario. So I need to find the people. So, so that, that, that does involve a certain amount of prowling around the business, um, understanding, talking to people who are um, trying to get things done, finding out what their problems are and what, where they've been running into roadblocks um, and, and which of those roadblocks would be things that a CDP might address. Not that the CDP is a solution in search of a problem, but if you do a broad analysis, remember some of our earlier uh, suggestions there about you know, understanding what your business needs are in general, and then seeing well, which of those needs might be met by a CDP, that, that's a good place to start. If you have needs that simply aren't CDP needs, you know, you know when you prowl around, you find the real problem is um, your email system is terrible or your website system is terrible. Uh, then you know you probably need to address that problem before you think about a CDP. So, talking to your your business users and also your technical people will surface those issues, and those are your stakeholders that you, that will then once you serve, once you determine which issues you're going to resolve with this project, those are the people who are the stakeholders in the project. Got it. Thank you. And our last question: Where would you look to find honest reviews or comments on CDPs? Well, there is this little thing called the CDP Institute, uh, www.cdpinstitute.org. I'll just sort of casually mention that. We do uh, publish uh, vendor comparison reports that have some information on CDPs. Uh, they are vendor neutral. Um, uh, they only go in so much depth. Uh, there are some other organizations that, that, that publish similar information. Uh, you know, we used to say go to trade shows. <laughs> can't really do that anymore. Uh, but there are a lot of online things. There are plenty of online forums. There are review sites. Um, but honestly, it's, it's, it's more talking to people who use these things. So where, wherever you, you, you bump into your peers, and they can be references from vendors, that's okay. Because um, I mean, honestly, at this point, there are probably people in your company who in their last job had a CDP because it's been around long enough for that. So there are places that you can go, you know, just people that you know in your own network, that's always the best, um, the best source of information are those things. But certainly poke around online, um, Gartner, Forrester, Real Story Group are, are people who publish uh, good information on that. Um, the, you know, places like G2Crowd, uh, some of the review sites, uh, again, have good information. But the thing about those, and all of those, every one of them, um, and I have nothing but respect for them all, is that they kind of tend to 
take a sort of a one size fits all approach. It's like, this is, this is a good system. This is why it's good. These are the features that it has. Well, if the features that it has are not the features you need, it may be a great system. But it's not the right, not the right system, not the right system for you. So that kind of generic published information is only good if you can look at it in depth and say, okay, this, this report shows that these are the four vendors that have this particular feature, and I need that feature. So it may be that they're the four vendors that have this feature that you don't need. Well, who cares? You don't care more than the point somebody else might care. So you really have to always go into these things with a certain amount of knowledge, of understanding of your needs, and then look at the published research to see how those vendors map up against your needs, not just just how they rank uh, in some you know sort of generic one size fits all ranking you know one size doesn't really fit all certainly not with CDPs so just be be careful I mean uh, that, that's why we never have done it in a, uh, you know like a magic quadrant sort of thing uh, because the, the, the implicit notion of a single ranking just doesn't make any sense it has to be tailored to your needs Okay, so it looks like that's all the questions. Um, thank you again, David, for presenting. Really good, insightful presentation. And thank you for um, presenting on behalf of Treasure Data. I want to thank you, everyone, to, for joining us today. So we'll see you next time. Great. Thanks, everybody. Okay, bye.